Hello, my name is Wes Rubalcaba, uh, and this is going to be an ad hoc session about using debugging tools. Um, I was assigned this yesterday at 4 p.m., so I think it'll be great. Uh, so I stole an outline from Mike Herschel, um, so if you don't like any of the content, please tweet at this man right here. Um, He's a cool guy. Organizes a Florida Drupal camp, which is probably the third best Drupal camp. Tell him I said that, please. Uh, anyway, so uh, debug tools. Uh, I'm going to go over Firefox a little bit and uh, mostly Chrome. Um, there's not an enormous difference, uh, but I am a little more comfortable in Chrome. And since I haven't got a whole lot of time to practice this, we're going to go with the one I'm comfortable with. But um, I have been, it, anecdotally, I'll say that uh, I've been enjoying debugging and working with CSS and Firefox, and I've been using that primarily for dev development lately. And uh, JavaScript, I'm more comfortable in Chrome, and I think there's maybe better tools there, but um, you know, your mileage may vary. Uh, so you may have noticed that I've been hacking at the lullabot.com site. This is not what the content is on the site. <clears throat> It is, in fact, this. Uh, so, first, uh, the way to bring up the uh, editor, there are some shortcuts, uh, F12 on Windows, uh, Command-Shift-I on Mac, I believe also Control-Shift-I yeah, on Windows, or um, also Linux. Uh, I like to have my uh, debug tools on the side here. That's because I can debug phone layout just by doing this, which is pretty slick. Um, also, I really love, in Chrome, they have like secret breakpoints that you can't affect, which is kind of annoying. Firefox um, it gives you more control over whether or not you get two panes here. But having the styles pane, and this is the computed pane side by side, is A+, plus, very awesome. Um, so let's talk about what we're looking at so far here. Uh, we have the elements pane. So this is a representation of the DOM. The DOM is not the HTML. The HTML is like the blueprint for a house, whereas the DOM is like an actual house where the kids wrote all over the walls and they changed the color of the paint on the door. Um, so it's a living, breathing version of the HTML. Um, so JavaScript might change it. Uh, if you're uh, a weirdo sitting in front of a lot of people, you might live hack it. Um, so you can kind of you know do whatever you want in here. Um, I use the arrow keys a lot uh, inside of this area. Um, so the DOM is a tree structure, uh, so if I press left, uh, it goes up the tree, uh, no matter where I am, how far down I am, left will bring me up. Uh, right will either expand things, left will also close things, uh, but right will expand things, and will also go to the first child if, uh, you know, it's something that has children. Um, <clears throat> so, let's see, what's next here? Oh, also, uh, Feel free to interrupt with questions at any point. So you can do all sorts of interesting things here. So if uh, you can right click, probably all have done this before, and, and investigate something, you can also drag it around uh, and move it somewhere else. There we go. I don't know where it went. There it is. <laughs> the styles aren't working anymore. Uh, so you can move things around. You can also edit them by pressing enter. Um, It'll get you into the different properties of the HTML element. Uh, press tab to make a new one. So I could say style equals color red. Um, now I have red text. Other thing you can do, you can copy and paste elements. This is something I do quite a bit uh, when I'm testing to see like how a grid layout might work. If, I'm, if I have uh, like three thumbnails and I want to see what it's like if nine are there, uh, you can right click on anything, so let's go back to, let's say this one, see how this list behaves. So I'm going to back out and try and find the outermost parent, there we go, so this, this one right here, you right click, copy, and you can cut or copy the element, and then I can select its parent and press control V, and there it is again. And if I press control V again, uh, it actually puts it inside of this one. <laughs> <laughs> or no, it did, yeah, it did. There it is. Yeah, it's, it's uh, buddied up with uh, one of its pals. I didn't really want to do that, so I can press Control-Z, uh, and I can go back out to the parent again and press Control-V again. Okay, there we have another one. 
uh, and you can kind of go on and on from there and see how things work out. Another nice trick when I'm not at home with my four monitors uh, getting a suntan, you can also, uh, with a small laptop, test larger screens by simply zooming in or out. Uh, this, is, as far as CSS layout is concerned, this is just like having a larger screen. You're not going to have any uh, significant rendering dis differences. Obviously, images are going to raster a little differently or some little things like that. But uh, layout is, uh, you know, it's going to be the exact same thing. Um, at least in modern browsers, I wouldn't trust older. Like, if you're using old IE, I don't, <laughs> I wouldn't guarantee that. Uh, and basically, what this is doing is it's pretending that. Uh, you have a higher density screen, so it's, uh, it's affecting the zoom, which just basically changes the screen density value, um, making everything render smaller and larger, which is really nice. You can also press Control-0 to reset zoom, uh, at least in most browsers. It's worked for me reliably. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? Okay, so I could be like, oh, where's this element? Okay, it's down, it's off the side of the screen here. I can right click, I can also go here and click, and go to scroll into view, and it brings me to that element. Very handy when things are hiding from you. Uh, another thing you can do, so uh, if you have hide and seek elements in CSS, that's often a very difficult problem uh, that no one likes to have. So if you, uh, if you press Control F in here, you can, you can do a text search, right? So I could say Lullabot, right? Oh, okay. It's there, it's there, it's there, it's there. I could also say, I could put in a selector for uh, things with a class. Uh, maybe the class has to equal, or maybe star equals, primary CTA. And then it'll find that. So you can put in whatever CSS selector you want. It's really handy if you're writing CSS and you're like, why isn't this applying to the thing? And then you, you go and look at the thing, your style's not even showing up. You're like, ah! You can just paste your selector in here and then just tweak it until it, until it finds your element. And you're like, ah, that was my problem. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? So we have the style pane. Uh, style pane's really nice. Uh, it will show you the styles that apply to this element in order of what applies to it the most and what applies it to, to it the least. And we're talking CSS specificity, so um, depending on how complex your selector is, so if it has a class or two classes or an ID or a tag, um, that'll change the level of specificity and important. So like a, what I like to compare specificity to uh, like a having a, a social atmosphere, so you don't, you don't want to be too loud. It's nice to have nice low specificity, like a coffee shop you can go and make a new feature, send in some CSS, and it's like, oh yeah, hey, you know, everyone's here chilling out, you can go over there, make that link red for me, that'll be great, thank you, okay. And then you can send in a new one, and they'll all just kind of like be having their own conversation, as opposed to like, if you have a lot of important or IDs, it's like a loud, awful bar, no one can hear each other, nothing useful is happening. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's hard to maintain when you have a lot of loud selectors. Um, when it comes to uh, style sheets and inline, uh, CSS, which is more dominant, inline CSS or style? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> inline meaning um, if I write the style attribute, uh, that is the most specific, the only way to over, the only reason I would ever recommend using important is if you have to override an inline style and you aren't able to remove it. Um, but that does create you know, a louder atmosphere. So then the next features you have to go send in, the next CSS you write has to be louder than that. And then you get this, what we call specificity war, uh, which is no fun and creates long-term maintenance issues. Uh, but a style block, so like the tag. Um, so if I, uh, let's see, how would I do that? Live demo. I'm gonna edit uh, the head as HTML. If I do a style tag here, uh, this just goes in the regular cascade. And you know, it, depending on where it is in the document, it'll be higher or lower in your CSS. Um, and but it'll have the regular specificity rules, and it'll be in the regular flow of the CSS om, which is a thing. Um, so yeah, another thing I'll do. I usually um, I would have I forgot to uh, start up a local. Uh, but if I have a uh, style sheet, and I'm like, is this thing even being loaded? Like, what's happening? Uh, the easiest way to tell is star, 
which means all of the things, but star has like no specificity basically. And then you can say color red, actually literally it has no specificity. <laughs> color red important. Ah, my style sheet's being loaded. This is affecting the document and it's a nice easy way to tell. And then you can refresh and make that go away because that's awful. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, so the style pane is nice just to get a view of kind of the hierarchy of styles, but if you're debugging, it's usually not very helpful. If you're trying to figure out why is this thing laying out this way, I do not recommend staying in styles. I go immediately to the computed pane. So if I want to know why or how they got the text down there, uh, I might navigate around here and find my text. And then here I could be like, okay, it looks like this is display grid. Aha, display grid, what's providing that? Oh, okay, I see. And then here you see the style that is winning. You can see what style sheet it came from. And you can see there was another style that got overridden. It came from the user agent style sheet. So by default, this was display block. So user agent style sheet just means that this is the one provided by Chrome or Firefox or whatever. Um, so there's always CSS on your page, even if you don't write any. Um, yeah. Another awesome feature here on these. Oh, and if you're um, if you're at a different breakpoint here, the computed uh, pane becomes a separate guy, and you could also uh, filter. Uh, so you can type in whatever you want, or you could say background. Okay, does it have a background? Okay, what has the background? Something has a background, right? And I'm navigating up the tree. Hopefully, something has a background. There we go. This has a background. <laughs> And you can see all the styles. And it just auto updates as I was navigating through the tree. So I found something, you know, hey, this thing has a background of black. I'm not sure what's providing it. Right click on it, look at the computer pane, type in background, and just navigate up the tree until you find the thing that has a background on it. And you're very likely to find it. I forget what this arrow does. Ah, yeah, okay. So it'll bring you over to the style pane and show you where that was applied. So you have a little, if you noticed here, this little arrow. So I only typed in my code background FFF, right? But that implies all of this because background is a shorthand. Um, so these are, these are all default uh, values of all these different properties that I didn't really care to set because I didn't need to. Um, oh, another awesome thing you can do. You have a couple of tools up here uh, that are a little hard to see. So we have this one called a hub. And so this is, you can toggle different states so I can say, oh, hover, not hover, hover, not hover. How about hover and visit it? Mm, okay, interesting. Focus, ah. And so you can click around, test your different styles. Um, I've had issues where if I have uh, a JavaScript behavior and I want to see what it looks like when this is hovered, sometimes it doesn't work. Maybe it's because they use something like hover that isn't hover. Uh, but I have had issues trying to you know, get like a drop down menu to stay open sometimes you're trying to use this. Usually it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, I haven't paid attention enough to figure out why. Uh, the other tool you have here is class. Oh, let's go up a level here. Class. And so I can add a new one. So uh, let's see, you, oh, and it's even, it's even suggesting stuff. That's wonderful. And so I can actually just go up and down with my arrow keys and see what that looks like, which is really cool. Um, you also notice, pro tip, uh, we have, we pre prefix all of our utility classes with U. Utility class just means uh, something that's single function. Uh, like this, this makes, you know, adds margin, or this makes the text centered, or this makes it look like, you know, a, a blue button. That would be, or even all of Bootstrap would be considered um, alt CSS are utility classes, um, except for its base styles, um, and all, all things like that. They're utility class systems. The, other, the opposite of utility class is um, explicit class. So if you think of BEM, uh, BEM would be, let's see, I know we have a bunch of it in here. Be bigger. Then would be like this link, this class right here, promo underscore underscore link. Um, and then we have a bunch in here as well. So we have topic, uh, decoupled Drupal, topic, 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 topic. 
Um, so these <coughs> class sizes are long and a little odd looking. Um, you can look up them to see what, why we have two underscores and two dashes, but these classes are very specific. So they're only applied to very specific things. I know exactly what's going on uh, as opposed to a, uh, so they describe what the thing is, not uh, how we want it to behave, which is a utility class. Another cool feature you may have saw me mess around with, um, refresh the page here again, get rid of that. Uh, I can, sometimes uh, you might get a little bored, you know, working in your SAS document or your CSS document, saving, coming back and refreshing, right? You're just like, I just need to hammer this out real quick, I kind of know what I'm doing. Uh, so you can right click, or I'm sorry, you don't right click. You, you click on something, get it in the inspector. So let's say I wanted to affect this, uh, actually let's do something where I actually know the classes. <laughs> we'll go with this guy. So I'll go find the one that I want to update, I can press add, right? It's like, oh okay, that's kind of cool. You can kind of do that with element style in here. I could say, you know, color red, uh, important. Please? <laughs> oh, it's because it's a link. Um, but another thing you might notice, when I pressed add, it made a best guess at what the selector could be. Uh, you may want to change that. You probably want to change it. In this case, it gave me a single class, which is good. That, that should uh, be sufficient and not too noisy, not too loud of a, of a selector. But it added an inspector style sheet. Isn't that interesting? If I click on that, oh, isn't that interesting? Huh. So you can type whatever kind of uh, styles you want in here. Uh, 50 EM. Bam! Uh, <laughs> and, and just uh, make your component look the way you want. When you're done, you can copy these. You could also save them, I believe. Somewhere <laughs> there's a way to save these, and I can't remember. So yeah, this brought us over to the sources tab, uh, which I'll go into a little bit later. But uh, so this is this is added as a fake file. Uh, but yeah, somewhere there is a way to save this, but I don't do this enough to remember. Ah, save as. So I right clicked on the tab. Oh, interesting. They have local modifications. I knew Firefox had it, but I couldn't find it in Chrome. So there you go. I uh, just right click that. So you can see what all you've been changing and hacking around on the document. Um, even if you've been changing like 20 things, it should all keep it there for you so you can go back and make the changes in your file. Um, which, which part? Oh, make the change. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. So I right clicked on the tab and then it said uh, local modifications. Oh, okay, local. Thank you. Yeah, actually, let me hop over to Firefox, which is more intuitive. Um, <laughs> So it, yeah, they have a great take a screenshot tool. It's just built into the browser, um, and there's great options for that. They also they also uh, the options for making changing the the color scheme of uh, this is is a lot better. Uh, you have this control here, which helps you. Oh no, I don't. Oh, there it is. Uh, control whether or not you get this sidebar. I love that sidebar. I also love this about it. Uh, there's a there's a tab called layout, which just doesn't exist in Chrome. Um, and in here, I can see every single item that has display grid on it, and then I can check the box, and the grid visualization is persistent. In Chrome, it, there used to be a way to make it persistent, but it, it changed or went away, uh, and I don't know where it went. So this is one of the reasons why I really like using Firefox for CSS. Um, it also has great visualizations for uh, things that are display flex. Let's see if I can find one. What is that noise? <laughs> Having a Grinch moment. All that noise, noise, noise. Uh, am I actually like hallucinating at the dentist or <laughs> I'm not here? Ah. Okay, come on, something's gotta be display flex.
If you notice all these things say grid, uh, you can click this as well. And it's the same as clicking the checkbox in the layout tab here. Um, anyway, there's a good grid visualization, visualization that lets you know what, where white space is and where you have uh, uh, you know, content that's being positioned and kind of the size of that content. Because Flexbox has a lot of uh, ways you can distribute the, the free space, uh, so it's kind of nice to know uh, how much space some things are actually taking up. Because sometimes they'll have transparent backgrounds or whatever and they're a little, a little harder to visualize. Um, so other things here, I mean, you, you see we have hover and class in here just like, uh, just like uh, Chrome. Uh, I can click on an element here and do the same trick of adding a style. And then I, get, I can come over here to my inline style sheet and again uh, do that with whatever, there we go. <laughs> uh, the changes in, in Firefox are a lot easier to find. There's just a tab called Changes, and there you have it, and I'll show you all the different document, or potential documents you changed. Um, what other? Uh, there's also nice tools around for, um, let's see, if we go here. I actually found this today in Chrome. It exists. It was just hard to find. It might have just been added, actually. That might be why I never saw it before. But uh, so this a tag has an animation on it somewhere. Uh, it's got to be that. Here it is. So on animations, if you uh, define a timing, could be, it, right now we did cubic bezier, which is a way to provide your own animation timing, uh, but you could also do just ease, you know, the most basic one, that's the default one. And then you can click on this icon, and down at the bottom it's showing you what that looks like with a ball moving side to side. And then you can choose other ones, so this one's awful, well that's actually not too bad, it looked awful yesterday. This one has a bounce, which means it passes the 100% mark and comes back, which is cool. It has a bounce on both sides. Uh, linear, extremely boring, do not recommend. Uh, you know, you have ease in, which is, you know, if you think of yourself easing into a pool, you like start off slow. Ease out is, you know, jumping out, uh, so you're uh, quick in the beginnings. Wait, yeah, quick in the beginning, slow in the end. Um, yeah, and then you can, you can use these points and make your own. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's clear the, the animation I want. Let's let's uh. Where's my? All oh, right. I'm not on the A. There we go. No hover. Oh, you can't really see it. Anyway. Oh, here we have inline flex. So this will show you. This is the uh, visual visualization for inline flex. Um, so you can kind of see that the text is only that large. It's being center, uh, vertically aligned uh, and centered. Uh, and if we went to layout, another cool thing about the layout tab is at the bottom, it'll show you the box model, but it'll also show you the, the styles that affect box models. So display, box sizing, float, line height, uh, margin, padding, border, all that stuff, uh, which is really handy just to see in one place because this is, like 90% of the time when you're like, why is this not doing what I want? It's a layout thing. It's like, yeah, could you just collect that in one place? Awesome, Firefox. Chrome should get it. Anyway. Um, yeah. I think that, is there, what are any other? Oh yeah, font is a great one. We'll do font real quick. So I will, yeah, we're on the A tag. Uh, this is another pane that's specific to um, to Chrome, or I'm sorry, Firefox, whichever one I'm in. So I get a little slider, uh, which is pretty cool if you're designing in the browser or you're just bored and you want to ruin a website. <laughs> this is a good way to do it. Um, letter spacing, the weight. So yeah, a lot of cool stuff here. Uh, it tells, tells you what font is actually being used right now, which is really nice, because you can look at the style, and that's nice to know, but like, is my web font actually applying? Like, that would even be better to know. So uh, Chrome also has this, so I'll hop back to Chrome. Um, so if I inspect, well, yep, my link is ridiculous. All right, there we go. 
If I inspect something, I believe it's at the very bottom here. No, not this one. Computed? Yes, here it is. So it says it rendered in Freight Sans Pro Bolt, and that is a network resource. It's a, so if I had a local version of the font that was loading instead of the network resource, that's often good to know, because sometimes people are like, oh, the font doesn't look right, and you look, go look on the computer because it's using the local version, not the your version, and maybe, you know, their local version. You know what's fun? Get, uh, get Freight Sans Pro, uh, if, it, if that's what your company size is using. Uh, download it. Or no, no, download Comic Sans, change its name to that font, install it on your boss's computer, and then when they go to the website, everything will be in Comic Sans. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's what I meant. All right. Can I just click on that uh, background color? You can have a color scheme showing up. Where is it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Click that's it. a good one. I think it only shows on the style side. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good catch. Yeah, it's a good one. Yeah, just click on it. I'm used to the designers telling me exactly what I, the color I have to use, so I like never get to use this. But yeah, that's a great one. Oh, and if you notice, this is using the new uh, what is it? Eight-digit hex. So the last two are opacity. And if you didn't know, these two numbers are the red value. These two numbers are the G value, and these are the B value. So if you ever wanted to hack a hex, a color hex, that's how you do it. Um, and the way, the way it works is it's just 0 through 9 and then A through F. Um, so it's a 16-digit uh, number. Right? 16? Yeah. Okay. Right, thank you. <laughs> this guy knows. Well, you, you could do this if you wanted. Uh, <laughs> um, that's okay. All right. So uh, another thing. I, I like to use a lot, and especially if, if we're uh, on CSS um, uh, debugging, if I wanted to know, oh, is my CSS file even loading? You could do the trick where I had the star and then color red important. You could also go to the network tab, and uh, this will show you all the things that load. A lot of times you'll have to reload the page to show anything. Uh, this is already filtered, so you have, uh, you can say all, and this is going to give you in uh, time that the thing was loaded, uh, what, what came in. Um, but you can sort by other things other than time. The waterfall here is showing you, uh, you know, basically a visualization of the timeline. I forget what each color is, but uh, you can get real into the nitty gritty if you're a network person and you're, you're trying to improve the performance uh, from, the, from the resource side. Um, XHR is basically ajax -y stuff, JavaScript requests. Um, JS would be JS files. CSS, CSS files. Uh, image, or images. Uh, media will be uh, uh, audio and video. Uh, yeah, and, and all these things, if you click on them, you can look at the headers. So headers are uh, uh, ways that the browser communicates with the server. So we, the browser said, hey, I want this. Um, I used a get method to try and get that. It came back with a 200, meaning, aha, we did well. Everything went great. Uh, you can see, oh, remote address. I'm actually not sure what that one is. Uh, and some other stuff that I don't understand because I'm a front-ender. I make the internet pretty, I don't know this. Uh, so then the response headers are what came back. So the server actually came back with something. Here's what it is. Uh, you can see the IP of the server, which can sometimes be helpful um, if you have a, uh, an environment where there are multiple web servers providing content and one's being a pain and it is somewhere <coughs> in here. Huh. Oh, maybe it's, no, it's not response. Maybe it was remote address. That might be it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you again. What's your name? Niraj. Niraj. Everyone thank Niraj. <laughs> Alright. Um, you can also see cache settings, all that stuff, if you're really into these kinds of things. Uh, preview is really handy sometimes. If uh, It'll show you the preview of the image, the font, whatever. So this is a really nice font preview. Uh, and yeah, I usually don't mess with any of that other stuff. And close that again. Um, oh, yeah. Another really useful thing. If a, if a web page is taking a long time, one thing might be the download, right? So when, you, when I pressed reload here, you'll see it says, okay, we did 32 requests, 658 kilobytes of transferred, um, and we finished in a second, so that's nice and fast. But 
uh, if, I was, if this was slower, I might be worried about, okay, are my images too large, or like what's happening here? So we can order by size. Um, so we can say, oh, okay, this 79.6 uh, kilobytes, wow, terrible. Uh, and then go talk to whoever uploaded that or make an image style or whatever we had to do. Uh, and then if I go to CSS here, for instance, uh, we could go into here, into this, and so we get a nice preview. I can, oops, nope, double clicking it does not what I wanted to do. I can right click it and open the sources tab. So here you notice that it looks terrible, um, but if you click this little guy here, it unminifies it. Um, so if, if your code was also uh, like uglified, sometimes in JavaScript they'll change the variables to be simpler. Um, unminifying it's not going to be the only thing you need to understand what's going on sometimes, but for CSS, unminifying it's usually the only thing you need to be able to read this. Um, let's see. Network tab. Oh yes, and one other thing. So, <clears throat> let's say we go to a site that has, <clears throat> oh god, terrible. So I, I'm picking a, a new site that hopefully won't, won't offend, but I know they all have terrible, terrible ads. So uh, I turned, oh no, I need to turn ad block off. There we go. Refresh. Okay. It burns. It burns their ads. Ah. <laughs> all right, so I could look at this JavaScript in the network tab. I could look at it from the uh, initiator. There's also, if I right click here, there's domain. Uh, so I could look at the domain of where these things are being provided from. And I'm like, oh, adservices.google. You can right click that and block request URL or block the domain. And this is temporary. Um, oh. Maybe not, because that's still blocked. <laughs> uh, I was trying to figure out where a uh, feature was coming from and uh, on a website, because I was asked to replicate it, and I just started blocking scripts. I was like, okay, when does it stop working? Oh yeah, it's those guys, cool. Uh, so yeah, you can block things. So when I reload the page, uh, you'll see we block two resources. And, th and then you can just toggle this, you know, if you wanted to, uh, to turn it off temporarily. Um, so that's a really nice way to kind of figure out where things are coming from. If you want to make the case that, uh, hey, maybe you should have less ad networks on your site because your site will speed up, uh, you could simply go in, block a few uh, ad networks, reload the page, and get an idea of the uh, speed increase. Um, also in here, we have, as soon as I find it, hmm, I thought it was in here. Um, well, disable cache is always good to have on. I like that one. There's also an option if you go into settings. Uh, I recommend turning on. Uh, where is it? Network. Disable cache while dev tools is open. Which might have been the same checkbox I checked, and that's just another way to look at it. But I always make sure I have that on. Um, okay, I'm looking for network simulation. Is anyone? Am I just missing it? Hmm. Performance tab. Oh, it's in the performance tab. All right, we'll get to that one. Okay, so I think I'm done with this tab. one is the performance tab. Very cool. <laughs> uh, so we have network throttling that we can apply. So this is not this is not the same as actually going out and testing on 3G. It's, it's simulating it, right? It's just uh, so, you know, in the real world you have m more problems than speed um, and the speed's going to be, the, the simulation is going to be consistent, right? Um, but you can pretend like you have fast uh, 3G, <laughs> slow 3G. Uh, you can add uh, uh, profile of your own. Uh, you can also pretend to have a slower CPU. Um, with this one, I, I specifically recommend going out and, and, and testing with real devices, but you know, if you're just at your computer and you want to do something quick and dirty, that'll do it. Uh, let's see. So, uh, performance tab, 
is a good way to figure out if your web if your website's running slow uh, and you think it's something that has to do with the what JavaScript you're loading or or like kind of the stuff going on on the page. This is the way to figure it out. So if I press record here, um, it'll record the page as is, and I can start interacting with it. So for instance, if I have uh, JavaScript on scroll and I want to see how it performs, I would do this, and then I would just start going like ah, bop, 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 and then stop it. And then see, okay, uh, what am I getting? Like, am I am I seeing slowdowns? Am I seeing things that I don't want to see? So here we have a timeline of what happened, uh, and we have some nice screenshots that show what was what was happening there. Uh, in this tiny garage, maybe you know this. How do I how do I make FPS bigger? I thought there was a way to see that. Okay. A stump garage. No, I know that. Yes. <laughs> I know too. It's like I'm right -click it. Yeah, I was trying that yesterday. I couldn't get it to work. that selection right there that you have selected. Right yeah. Okay. Never mind. Yeah. All right. Well, at least we both don't know. Huh? So I only look at the bottom uh, pane, the summary pane. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Looking to see what images are messing up and whatnot. Oh yeah, so the escape button will bring up the bottom, which is usually console, but uh, here's the changes. I guess you can bring, if you, if you want to see what CSS you changed, you can, uh, if, it's, if the tab isn't showing, you just click the uh, kebab menu. So every, every menu has a meat dish. There's hamburger, there's kebab, falafel. Uh, <laughs> this is kebab. All right, so, but anyway, you have changes here. Uh, so if I was changing CSS, but anyway, let's get back to um, uh, the performance tab here. So he, here we have a summary. Uh, this is telling us, you know, in the in the time that we have selected, which is currently all of my my performance recording, uh, what did we spend our time on? Uh, and then here we have some slowdowns or some problem areas. So I might zoom in here, and say like, oh, okay, scripting is my problem here. So let's look at. Okay, I have a function here, timer fired, wait, call tree, mirage, what am I doing? <laughs> uh, <laughs> in the slowdown, you should be able to see like... There's a frame plate icon there, I don't know, right above summary? Uh-huh, uh-huh. I don't uh -huh. know if that will do anything. Like if you expand that there... Well, usually when I look at slowdowns, I'll be able to see like, oh, okay. You can actually expand that. Right. I'll, oh yeah, here we go. I'll actually start seeing files like, oh, okay, this was called by this, this was called by that. So this is just all inside one file. And usually this will be like the, the like if somebody has jQuery on here, like there'll be like 20 jQuery calls. You look at it, it's all minified nonsense, right? Because jQuery is like crammed down. Uh, but then you, if you track down far enough, you're like, oh, this came from digitrust.min. I'll go talk to those people. Um, and then if you click on it, go to the sources tab. Uh, if it looks terrible, you can unminify it to be like, oh, okay, this is the function that was called. I can kind of see what's going on here, hopefully. And I can talk to, you know, uh, whoever has that resource or hopefully edit it myself. Uh, other things to note in here. Let's look. What did I tell myself I was supposed to do? Yeah. Oh, right, right, right. Well, actually, let's so let's do the other thing. So that that was an example of just recording something while so like the page is already loaded and I want to see what happens when I scroll fast or whatever something or resize is another thing that can choke <laughs> up the CPU. Uh, but you also have this uh, this reloads the page and then captures the load process. Uh, so load is a pretty critical time. You're the first uh, interaction with the site for the user, and this is going to take forever because. It takes forever for the JavaScript of every single ad network to come in. There we go. But it'll it'll stop itself when it's when it's um, loaded everything. I think it's when it hits the load event, or maybe shortly after. Yeah. Something like that. Um, but you'll also be able to see. Let's see. Um, these bars are different important events. I think this one's load. I forget how to tell. There we go, on load event. Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm usually on a much bigger <laughs> computer screen. Everything's small and weird. Uh, so all these red areas are areas where 
uh, our frame rate was was not good or there was uh, there were things that were taking too long it's kind of like hey yeah you should go check that out uh, so if we go in here hopefully we'll be able to uh, scroll down <laughs> uh, so hopefully we can go find a problem child here let's go look over here Come on. Here we go. Okay, so here we see uh, this red triangle here. This is this, so Chrome is telling us, hey, there's something that took too long. Um, so this was, let's see, we can click on it, go into the bottom up or the call tree, and see if we can figure out why it took too long. Uh, so timer fired, and then we can look at okay, maybe you know provider dot what's it. Uh, if we wanted to, to test to see if uh, the, the page performed much better without this, we might block the domain of provider.hls. Uh, we could also go in, there's probably, yeah, this here, uh, which, will, which will tell us that the, you know, JavaScript was the problem. Uh, different colors in here mean different things. Purple is repaint. Uh, repaint is when the browser, like something has changed visually, and it's, an, it's enough that uh, you know, the browser has to repaint and you want to minimize repaint. So there are different ways to do that. Um, the will change property on modern browsers, uh, the CSS property, if you have something that's causing a lot of repaint, consider putting will change on it. Um, it just means that the browser takes that area. Um, and so will change, you'll say like will change background or will change you know, pattern, or whatever, whatever's going to animate or change um, the browser will render that on a different uh, layer, like if you think of a Photoshop layer, it'll kind of keep that thing whole, and so when it changes, it's, easy, it, it's easier for it to re-render it, and it has to mess with less of the page. Uh, you don't want to put will change on everything, because just like in Photoshop, having a million layers is bad, uh, but if you have something that's misbehaving or not animating very well, uh, that can very likely fix it. Um, uh, I'll look to my co-presenter. Is there anything else I should be showing off in the performance tab? <laughs> okay, I think I think I got it too. Okay, good. Uh, we can show breakpoints for JavaScript. Yeah, yep, yep. So, another thing we can do here, uh, we can put in breakpoints. So breakpoints, if, you, if you're not familiar, it just stops an application, whether it's a, you can have a server-side breakpoint in PHP, or you can have one in JavaScript as well. Um, so if I look here, actually I'll inspect this guy. And I'm gonna cheat, and I know that uh, this is changing that class because I can watch it blink at me. Uh, so I can right-click on here, and there's a number of things you can look at uh, to break, just pause the application so you can see what's going on in a critical moment. So you can break on subtree modification. That means that if, you know, the DOM, the tree order, if something in there changes, it pauses. Uh, attribute modifications, which is what I'm going to do because it's changing, uh, it's flipping a class or something. And then node removal is, you know, deleting something from the tree. Uh, so we'll do attribute modifications. And then when I hover, boom, pause. And so now it, uh, it brought me to the piece of JavaScript that paused it. That, that's not usually very helpful, because again, it's usually, um, oh, <laughs> there we go. Uh, it's usually gonna be in some weird minified file, uh, and it's, it's uh, yeah, whatever this is. But if we look at the call stack here, we can, we can come back and start looking, okay, that, got, that was called from there, then that was called from there, okay, still not very helpful. Ah, set pull down open. I think a human wrote this. Uh, and so then you can see, okay, we're in Drupal behaviors, nav pull down, and you can see what was happening here. You also get a nice visualization of uh, certain in scope variables, so you can see what element is from the, from the parameter here. <coughs> uh, yeah. This is usually about as far as I get before I go back to my code. Where I'm just like, ah, yes, here's what's happening. And then, you know, I kind of figure out what my problem is. Um, it's usually my fault. Uh, let's see. What do you think? Anything else, Naraj? Different mobile screen and tablet screen. Hmm? And do switch the tablet screen and whatnot. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's a good one. 
I think, what about in, uh... It's right there. Uh, break, well, I mean for breakpoints, oh, is there anything? Breakpoints. Um, probably good for breakpoints. But yeah, let's do that. Let's, so we're gonna hop back to, uh... This is, well, okay. I should tell you, I should show you the, uh, so this is resume everything, you know, keep going, no more breakpoints. This is like, oh, we stopped a little early, just take a take another step forward and then tell me where you get. Oh, I'm not there yet. Take the, oh, okay, all right. So you can kind of like step through your code a little bit um, and it'll stop at certain points and then you can see if that's, you know, the code that you're trying to figure out where something's going wrong or not. Uh, it could be really helpful, but we'll do that. Uh, the other thing with breakpoints, if I can, Find them. Uh, is it in the escape? No. No, not performance. Again, any problems with this? Uh, tweet at Mike Herschel. Uh, threads. Oh, here we go. Call stack. Breakpoints. Here we go. So uh, I can keep track of my breakpoints. Uh, oh, another way to make breakpoints, you can type in your JavaScript code the word debugger, then colon, um, and on most browsers that will pause it when it hits that piece of code, but you can also click on a line of code here, and then you'll notice that here's a breakpoint, uh, and then you can check and uncheck it. So unchecking it will just temporarily uh, disable it, but you can enable it immediately. Uh, and it'll also be there if you reload the page. Don't make me a liar, don't make me a liar. All right, yeah. So we have uh, we have these breakpoints still here from that line that I clicked. Ah, I know another one. Before we go move to something else. Uh, so when you inspect an item, uh, you can also look at oh, not DOM breakpoints, event listeners. So event listeners are going to show you anything that could possibly interact with this. So it's going to show you an event that's applied to this exact object, but it's also going to show you events that are applied to the body, because this is inside of the body, and anything in between that has a listener, because that might interact with this. Uh, so we have click. Uh, we have all these different click handlers. Uh, let me see if I can break something. Uh, a tag, no, and you trigger a, there we go, okay. So we could look here and look at the click handlers. So these are all applied to the document. They're probably not what I want. Uh, these are applied to this long selector. Oh, if you hover, yeah, it's gonna show you what, what that is. So this one's applied specifically to this. So I can look at this, see like, okay. I can see where it's uh, defined. I can also eh, no. Where is it? You can delete it. And yesterday I was able to do this. Ah. Yeah, so it says remove here, but I don't know what happens when it's, it's running off the screen. <laughs> it doesn't want to do it. But anyway, you can remove uh, click handlers if you want. I'm not sure why you would. Um, never use before unload. It's mean, it's mean, man. Uh, before unload is what ad networks use to capture data right before the page moves on to another page. So if you're worried about your page performance, check to see if some ad network has put up before unload on there for you because that will uh, feel like the next page load is slow, but it's actually happening on the current page. Very uh, uncool ad networks. Um, all right, so let's see, we'll do the, well, actually let's keep on JavaScript. So uh, a lot of you are probably familiar with the console. Uh, so I pressed escape here to get the console to come up. Uh, the console is an interactive uh, uh, console. <laughs> so you're, you're interacting with the JavaScript on the page, you can type in whatever you want. Uh, you can access variables, so if I start typing in Drupal, you'll see that it says, oh yes, I know what this is. And then you can say dot, and then it'll show you any possible thing that could come after this. So I got it. Oh, behaviors dot. Ooh, what behaviors do they have? And then you can check into this. Um, and you could even see what's in here if you want. Uh, so what's an attach? Um, ah, yes. And it even gives you a nice, nice link to the file. Um, 
You can actually set your own variables. I've actually copied entire functions into here before from my code, be like, why is this not working? Uh, that's a good way to do it. Uh, but the other way is usually you put in a breakpoint in the middle of your function, either by adding a bugger or finding it in here and clicking the line number. Um, so you can say, you know, const uh, document dot get, oh, no, no wait, right, variable name. I'd done this before. Body equals uh, document dot get element by tag name, paren, uh, body. And then it, it's usually going to say undefined, but then I could say, hey, what's body? And it's like, oh, okay, that's body. Uh, so it's a nice little trick. And if you, t if you type in a whole function in there, so you could set a function equal to a variable and then use it in the, in the console, uh, you could interact with the page. So I can say um, the body dot uh, Isn't there, huh, I thought there'd be a method to like delete this. I don't know it off the top of my head. Anyway, but you could interact with the body from here. Uh, class list, should have class list, no? Um, yeah. huh. All right, well, live demo. Uh, so another thing that's really cool about this, if you are on an element in the elements tab, this one, uh, you'll notice it says dollar sign zero in there. That means that if you want to mess with this, you can just type zero in here. And uh, there it is, and it's the same thing here. So it's a nice shortcut. If you're trying to interact with something on the DOM, you can just find it and then use that variable. Uh, if I click on another one, it's going to be zero. I believe there's, well, maybe not. There might be a way to keep that variable. You probably set it to something else. Um, Mike's notes say console.table. That's probably not supposed to be capitalized because that doesn't make any sense. Which is a function which is undefined. Huh. All right, sorry. Don't know what that one means. Design mode. Well, I'm not sure what design mode is. You could Google it. It's in Mike's notes, though. Sorry about that. So we talked about sources. Uh, network also has a film strip view. When you reload the page, you can see how it's loading in, uh, which is nice for uh, if we want to see when web fonts come in or. Uh... Oh no! Wait, no, that was performance. I'm sorry. The. the uh... I believe he's talking about this. Um, all right, so that's all well and good. Let's do an audit. Well, before we do an audit, if you haven't seen this before, this toggles uh, 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 device simulation. By default, it usually goes to responsive. Responsive just means you can do this. Um, the one thing I do not like about this is now I have a mouse, or I have a, I have a, t a finger, a touch, uh, so I lose hover, um, and sometimes I want to change the screen to a certain size and have a mouse, but I, I honestly am not sure. It m might be in sensors. Mm. Yep, device-based. Now, yeah, right, I've done this before. I want to disable it, and it's like, nah, you press that button, so you must want touch. Um, but yeah, you can also pretend to, you know, uh, be in London and see what this website does, uh, change your orientation. Uh, so if you have code that's looking for changes in orientation or uh, CSS that's going to uh, trigger on that. Uh, you also have a number of lists here. This does not change the rendering engine. So if you're looking for CSS bugs on a Pixel, well, Pixel 2 is a bad example because it, it's Chrome, so it might do a decent job. But if you're looking for a rendering on an iPhone X, this is not going to happen. This is still rendering in Chrome. It's just it's uh, simulating the screen size um, and maybe some other things. But uh, for all my uses, I've only cared about the screen size. 
Uh, oh, and then another cool thing here is you can these these little guys here are uh, shortcuts to increase or decrease the size of the screen. You could also set this to be much larger, so I can say 1600 pixels, and uh, it zooms out, so it keeps keeps the, the uh, everything in view, so that I can pretend like I have a desktop monitor here and see how the page interacts with me. How are we doing on time? Oh wow! Ha! Huh, I can run my mouth. All right. Any questions? Anything to show before we peace out? Okay. I got one last thing. I just, I, I meant to. I should have paid attention to the time. Um, audits. So this audits in Chrome uses uh, uh, Lighthouse, which is really nice. A lot of former tools, uh, their audits were based on look on looking through the code and kind of regexing. So the, the the audits were like, yeah, you, I probably did something bad, but you don't really know because you're just regexing through my code. This actually runs some real tests. Um, so it's a it's a nice um, uh, it's a nice tool to kind of figure out how things are going. Uh, we worked on Sci-Fi. It's it's not going to have a good score, but it's not our fault. It's Ad Networks, so don't blame on us. But anyway, I believe it's in the 20s. But yeah, they give you a score and tell you what you're doing well on, what what you stink at. Um, <laughs> interesting, and then it tells me facts, guilts me for having a slow site because it's taking too long. Um, but yeah, so you can have diff you saw that there were different settings that so we have uh, the different kinds of tests that we can look at. We can do throttling, uh, device size, all these kinds of things, and these kind of give you an idea of what you need to improve on. And like I said, it's a lot more accurate than things like I believe Y Slow was one where the tests were um, not reliable because they they were taking shortcuts. Um, and at the time, computers weren't nearly as good, so I don't blame them. But um, Lighthouse is a lot better of a tool. There's also, um, what's it called? Oh, shoot. What's the, what's the site where you can get some guy from Dulles to uh, see how fast your site is? It, uh, it's like speed, not speed test. Oh my goodness. <clears throat> I've used it a lot. Web page test, webpagetest.org. So this is a great site. Um, a wonderful human being has a bunch of uh, computers in his basement in Dulles, not too far from here, and he'll test on all sorts of devices, and then you'll get all sorts of great uh, uh, visualization. So it'll show you the network waterfall, it'll show you all sorts of things, and it's running on actual devices. But let me get back to my audit here, so you can see they give me performance, accessibility, best practices, SEO, <laughs> obviously they're gonna be good at that. Uh, and you can kind of get an idea of what you could be better at. Uh, and if you open any of these, it will give you links uh, to great articles and documentation. Highly recommend doing this on your website. All right. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Ross.